raid the home and office of former Trump personal attorney Rudy Giuliani. The FBI executing a search warrant today and seizing the former mayor's electronic devices, including his cell phone. What we've learned tonight. All this comes on the same day as President Biden's first big speech to Congress. Tonight, everything you need to know. What buy-in will the president need for his bold proposals to turn into reality? The reaction coming in from both sides tonight. Eight days after voting to convict Derek Chauvin of murder, our conversation with one of those jurors, what the weeks-long trial was like, and how they dealt with the weight of that decision. It was tough. Uh... It definitely took a few days to recover um, mentally and emotionally once the trial ended. Breaking news tonight from the Justice Department, the hate crime charges in connection with the death of Ahmaud Arbery. The push to vaccinate millions of hesitant Americans. In one city, a major drop in demand has health officials scrambling to administer thousands of doses before they expire tonight. Sending the troops home from Afghanistan. We are on the ground there as the U.S. gets ready to end America's longest war. Can I ask, do you feel betrayed? I must say that, um, it, yes, it has become not only a strategic failure for our international friends, but I must say also a moral failure. And the historic expedition, 19,000 feet up to a stunning corner of the planet. Our conversation with the scientist who journeyed to the top of a volcano, what he put there, and what he hopes all of us will learn from it. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. On the same night, President Biden is set to give his first joint address to Congress and lay out his optimistic vision for the next four years. He cannot escape the shadow of the last four years. Today in Manhattan, the FBI raided the home and office of former President Trump's attorney, Rudy Giuliani. Agents woke him up at 6 a.m., seizing the former mayor's electronic devices, including his cell phone. The warrant was related to the ongoing investigation into Giuliani's alleged lobbying efforts in Ukraine while serving as now former President Trump's personal attorney. Our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, leads us off. New York City police officers were seen this afternoon leaving the apartment building on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, where Rudy Giuliani lives. Giuliani was awakened at 6 a.m. this morning by federal agents armed with a search warrant. They seized his electronic devices, including his mobile phone, and they also raided his office and seized the computer of his longtime assistant. It's an extraordinary turn of events for the former mayor of New York City, who had also served as the personal lawyer for President Trump. And it marks a dramatic escalation of an investigation that has been underway for nearly two years. Today, Giuliani's son lashed out. This is disgusting. This is absolutely absurd. And it's the continued mobilization of the Justice Department that we have seen. And it has to stop. If this can happen to the former president's lawyer, this can happen to any American. Enough is enough. A source briefed on the investigation tells ABC News federal prosecutors wanted to do this last fall, but the request was denied by the Trump Justice Department because it was too close to the election. Last year, Giuliani dismissed speculation he was seeking a presidential pardon. Giuliani, what is your response to claims that you're seeking a pardon? I'm not. <laughs> According to Giuliani's lawyer, federal agents were looking for information related to Giuliani's activities in Ukraine in 2019, when he was attempting to get the Ukrainian government to investigate Joe Biden son, Hunter. They are also looking to see whether he was also acting as a foreign agent on behalf of clients in Ukraine. Giuliani has long insisted he has just been fighting the good fight for Donald Trump. I started my career, and maybe I'll end it, rooting out corruption at the highest levels of government. But now he finds himself investigated by the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, a high-profile post where Giuliani himself made his name. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, some aggressive action today by law enforcement. What did the raids tell us about just how serious this investigation is? Well, it shows this investigation is quite far along because the bar to getting a search warrant for a lawyer, any lawyer, let alone the lawyer uh, for a president or a former president, is very high. Prosecutors would have had to convince a judge, Lindsay, that, uh, that the raid itself was likely to produce evidence of a crime. And how is Rudy Giuliani's team responding tonight? Giuliani's lawyers are, are firing back, accusing this of being a political uh, matter. And Giuliani's lawyer said that prosecutors, quote, are trying to make Rudy Giuliani look like a criminal.
Lindsay. Jonathan Carl staying on top of all of this for us. We appreciate it. And now to the historic night ahead in our nation's capital when President Biden delivers his first address to a joint session of Congress and the American people coming on the eve of that 100 days in office milestone. He took office during a once in a century pandemic after millions of Americans had lost their jobs. But tonight, Biden is expected to strike an optimistic tone. What will this address look like and what are his critics saying about tonight? ABC's Mary Bruce reports. Tonight, President Biden putting the finishing touches on a presidential address like none we've ever seen before. The usually packed House chamber will be largely empty. Just 200 people instead of the usual 1,600. Only a fraction of Congress will be there. From the Supreme Court, just Chief Justice John Roberts attending. The full cabinet won't be present either, so no need for the usual designated survivor. No special guests in the First Lady's box either. Everyone who is in the chamber, socially distanced and in masks. But there will be history made. For the first time ever, two women, the vice president and the House speaker, will be sitting over the president's shoulders. The speech, a chance for Biden to tout his accomplishments so far. According to excerpts, he will tell Americans, 100 days since I took the oath of office, lifted my hand off our family Bible, and inherited a nation in crisis. The worst pandemic in a century, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, the worst attack on our democracy since the Civil War. Now, after just 100 days, I can report to the nation America is on the move again. One day after telling vaccinated Americans they could lose their masks outside. Good afternoon. His handling of the pandemic will be front and center in tonight's remarks. We're saving thousands of lives and more and more as each day goes by. But the president will also highlight what comes next, his recovery push, urging Congress to pass his $2 trillion infrastructure bill and unveiling a new sweeping child care and education plan, calling for universal pre-K for all three and four-year-olds, two years of tuition-free community college, subsidized child care for low-income families, and 12 weeks of paid family leave. The cost? $1.8 trillion. Another multi-trillion dollar smorgasbord of liberal social engineering. The president now asking Congress to pass a total of more than $4 trillion in new spending and to pay for it by raising taxes on the most wealthy Americans. Mary Bruce joins us now from the Capitol. Mary, the president has certainly watched many of these speeches in his time in Washington, but of course this will be the first time that he actually delivers the address. And early experts show that he's going to really try to rally the country, saying America is on the move again. What else can we expect in his message to Americans? Well, Lindsay, the president is really trying to build off of the goodwill that he has earned with voters through his handling of this pandemic. But he's also going to argue that this country still has a lot to prove. He's going to say, quote, we have to prove democracy still works, that our government still works, and that we can deliver for the people. Lindsay. Mary Bruce, our thanks to you. From impending doom to cautiously optimistic, that is the evolution of sentiments felt by the head of the CDC over just the past few weeks. And as some states start loosening restrictions, there's concern tonight over the Americans still holding off on getting their vaccines and how to convince them to get a shot. Eva Pilgrim reports. Across the country, vaccination sites running out of willing arms. In Philadelphia, a push to get through 4,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine before it expires tomorrow. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it because I want to go see my grandson and my daughter. It comes as a new CDC analysis of real-world data of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines shows that fully vaccinated adults 65 and older are 94% less likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19. Still, many people people don't want a vaccine. I heard a lot of stuff and I'm afraid. With the push to get everyone 16 and over vaccinated, a tragic reminder of the threat for those who are still unprotected. In Hawaii, a boy under the age of 10 vacationing with his family died after getting the virus. Health officials say the child who had underlying health conditions began showing symptoms shortly after arrival. His parents were vaccinated and had tested negative before traveling. 
Overall, cases across the country are dropping. Just a month after the CDC director warned of impending doom, today, a hopeful tone. We think that this is related to increased vaccination, increased people taking caution. And so I'm cautiously optimistic with that we're turning the corner. Sorry to hear about the passing of her father. Certainly, Eva Pilgrim joins us now. Eva, a few weeks ago, Michigan was really struggling to contain the virus, but it seems now, now that they've turned a corner. What's the latest out of that state? Yeah, some positive news out of Michigan. It appears that the new cases and hospitalizations have gone down. And I know talking with Detroit health officials, they have been making a big push on the ground, actually going door to door to every home in the city of Detroit, trying to encourage people to get the vaccine. They told me they will go back two or three times if they need to. They are really trying to get people to take this vaccine. Lindsay. Eva Pilgrim, our thanks to you. And now to new developments in a shooting death that captured national attention. Ahmad Arbery was killed while out for a jog in Georgia back in February 2020. The incident captured on cell phone video that went viral. Now a federal grand jury has charged Travis McMichael, Gregory McMichael, and William Bryan with hate crimes and attempted kidnapping. These men were already charged with state law crimes, including felony murder, to which they've pleaded not guilty. For more now on these new federal charges, we bring in ABC's Chief Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Pierre, thanks so much for joining us. Walk us through, if you would, what federal prosecutors are alleging in this case and what makes these new charges different from those that they already faced. Lizzie, federal charges just being brought by the Justice Department, and they're making stark and sobering allegations. Prosecutors claim that Armored Arbery is dead because of his race. They claim that Arbery, who was simply jogging on a public street, as you said, was targeted, kidnapped, and fatally shot because he's a black man. Father and son, Gregory and Travis McMichael, and their friend, William Bryan, tonight are charged with federal hate crimes, including attempted kidnapping, firearms offenses as well. The men also face state murder charges, but tonight, the Justice Justice Department's weighing in, alleging that Arbery's civil rights were violated, Lindsay. And we hear a lot about so-called hate crimes, but it's still somewhat rare to be charged with this kind of crime. And it sounds like it can be challenging for prosecutors to prove. It's challenging because prosecutors have to prove intent, that the violation was because of a person's race. In this case, the Justice Department is alleging they have information that those men solely targeted Arbery because he's a black man. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. A North Carolina judge has said that he will delay the public release of the police body camera footage of the shooting of Andrew Brown Jr. by 30 to 45 days. The news comes after days of protests demanding transparency and an independent autopsy revealing that Brown was hit by a gunshot in the back of his head. Family attorney Ben Crum says that he, quote, vows to keep the pressure to get the video released sooner. And we turn now to the conviction of former officer Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. In the first TV interview with one of the 12 jurors who found Chauvin guilty, my colleague Robin Roberts sat down with Brandon Mitchell, previously known to us as Juror 52. He told Robin that serving on that jury meant, quote, watching somebody die on a daily basis. And Brandon Mitchell is kind enough to join us tonight. We appreciate you coming on the show, Mr. Mitchell. As you said on Good Morning America, you had to watch and rewatch video of George Floyd dying. And then at the end of the trial, you, you helped send another man to prison, potentially for decades. I can only imagine the stress and the weight of all of that. What was the emotional toll on you? Um, it, it was tough. Uh, it definitely took a few days to recover um, mentally and emotionally once the trial ended. I mean, and then each weekend with the, while the trial was going on, um, I definitely valued that time away from the trial just for my own, my own mental and emotional health. And you also said that the judge had instructed you didn't watch the news during the, the course of the trial. When you were able to tune in, were you at all surprised by the public reaction to the guilty verdict? And, and was the country's response something that, that you had been concerned about or preoccupied about uh, while you were deciding Chauvin's fate? Um, I still have not tuned in to the news. Um, even with me being on the news all today, I still have not tuned in just because I'm still somewhat decompressing. Um, I don't want to rush it. I don't want to move too quick. Um, but no, I, I don't feel like there was any pressure or anything like that. Uh, like I said, none of us really paid attention to any anything going on outside of the outside of the jury room and outside of the the four walls of the courtroom. 
And you, of course, voted to convict Chauvin. But was there anything at all, any kind of evidence or testimony presented by the defense that, that ever gave you pause about Chauvin's guilt? Um, no. Um, I thought th their strongest point was just the opening statement, and I, I just waited for their, for an aha moment the entire time. Um, I was waiting for that moment for them to have some some evidence that was just damning and just be like, I could just be like, wow, that's that piece of evidence that they maybe could use that can um, change my mind, but I've never seen it. Take us inside that, that deliberation room, because I've been a juror before, and you kind of take a, an unofficial poll when you first sit down just to kind of get the temperature of the room, who thinks this person is guilty or, or not. Did you guys do something like that? Was there any one at all that you felt at some point we might have to convince this person, or you all were all on the same page right from the beginning? Um, we, we definitely had a preliminary poll that we did at first, like a prelim preliminary vote, just to see where everybody was. Um, there was nobody necessarily on the not guilty side, but there was, you know, people that were unsure at the time. Um, and they just needed some more time just to be sure on, on which way they wanted to go. Um, so we, we talked it out, and they, they all came to, uh, to a consensus. Everybody came to a consensus and was comfortable with the decision that we made. Anything that surprised you during that deliberation? Any kind of conversation or question? Um, there was nothing too surprising. I think I think I was actually most surprised that we were not in and out of there in less than an hour. Um, that was probably the most surprising thing for me. Because it was a little over 10 hours, and so you're saying really during that time, people were really trying to figure out and, and come to a conclusion. Yeah, we wanted to make sure everybody was on the same page and comfortable with being um, on the same page and ready to make the decision before we submitted anything. We really wanted to make sure everybody was comfortable. And, and lastly, what do you hope comes out of this landmark trial of which you played such a, a pivotal role? Yeah, well, I, I'm really just hoping for some type of change within um, the policing within the policing in America. Uh, you know, black men are being killed at a disproportionate rate by police officers. And I mean, that's not what they're supposed to be here for. They're here to protect and serve. And uh, we need to figure out a way to, to, to get that going, just the protection and the serving of the communities. And that's it. Brandon Mitchell, once again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the fulfillment of your civic duty. Uh, we imagine that it has uh, taken quite a toll. And so we appreciate you. Yes, I appreciate you all for having me on here today. And we're joined now by White House Deputy Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Lindsay. Hello. So often these speeches to the joint session of Congress have lofty rhetoric and ambitious proposals that don't really reflect the political realities of what can actually get passed, especially in a divided Congress. So how does the president plan to address that divide on issues like policing reform, on the heels of the Chauvin verdict, immigration reform, and gun control measures so that something actually gets done? Yeah, thank you for the question. Look, tonight is a, a critical night for the president. As you know, this is on the eve of his first 100 days in the office uh, of the presidency. And he came uh, into the office with multiple crises that he's talked about, the economic crises, the climate change crises, the pandemic uh, crises, and also this racial uh, uh, crises that we're in, the, equi the inequality, the system systemic racism that he has talked about uh, for some time now. Now, especially during the campaign, about the moment that we're in as a country. And so tonight, as you just stated, uh, Lindsay, he's going to talk about a couple of things. He's going to uh, talk about the American Families Plan and talk about the investment in, in children and families and our kids and our grandkids. But he's also going to talk about police reform, and he's going to talk about immigration and gun safety. And as it comes to police reform, the president has been very clear. It's time that we take action. Uh, it's time for, uh, for us to do real police reform. He has supported the George Floyd Justice Police Policing Act, and he's asked Congress to move forward with it. He's put out a, a statement uh, of support for that piece of legislation. And so he'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. I don't want to get too much uh, ahead of him, but it is an, a critically important issue uh, for the president. And uh, as you know, Lindsay, because I know you've covered this, uh, the, the president got to, got to know the George Floyd family uh, pretty well over the last couple of months. He called them on the night 
of, uh, of the verdict, on the day of the verdict. And so this is something that he has watched closely and, uh, and really wants some change to happen, some fundamental structural change to happen uh, with when it comes to police reform. And he'll talk more about that, with, about all of this tonight. And the president, of course, is going to be talking to members of Congress, but he's also addressing the American people at large. So what's the most important message that he's trying to convey to Americans who are watching at home? Yeah, I, you know, as we know, George, uh, as you know, President Biden really is someone who can connect with the American people. Tonight, he'll be talking directly to them. He'll be talking about how government can work, right? When you look at the American Rescue Plan meeting the moment and you see the evidence of that working right now, especially in this pandemic that we're in. And he wants to make sure people understand that. He's going to talk about the year that we've been, been through and how far we've come, the successes that we see with the $200 million doses and arms when it comes to the vaccine strategy that he's put forth, the money that, that came out of the American Rescue Plan to open up schools safely, to help small businesses, to help families. So he'll talk about that, but he'll also talk about how do we use that momentum from the first 100 days into the next stage uh, of where we need to go. And that's really, truly in investing in families, investing in this country. And that is the American Families Plan, which, he'll, as, as I mentioned, he'll talk a little bit more tonight, and also the American American Jobs Plan, which was the first package that he uh, unveiled about a month ago. And, and yes, of course, as you were just talking about the American Families Plan, he's going to really give that explanation. But when we talk about investing in expanding access to education and child care, with his combined infrastructure plan, the price tag on both measures will approach $4 trillion. How will the president really make that case to Republicans as well as moderate Democrats who he'll need to get this through Congress to actually support either measure with that large of a price tag? tag. Well, a couple of things, Lindsay. Look, one of the things that we have realized in this pandemic is how badly uh, people have been left behind. The middle class, the working class uh, have not been moving forward with the economic growth that we have seen. And we, this is something that we know, like when, when we see G GDP go up and we see unemployment and economic growth, it should bring everyone along. And so one of the things that Joe Biden has talked about, the president has talked about, is building back better than we were before. And we can't go back to before for the, uh, the pandemic, we have to move forward in a way where there's equity in that, where we don't leave these families who just can't, are not able to get those basic needs behind. And so this needs a big investment. This needs focus. This needs real investment. And so what the president has been doing is meeting uh, in a bipartisan way in the Oval Office with folks on the Democratic side, folks on the Republican side, and having that conversation, the way he sees it is he put his plan together and if people have ideas of to do it better and how to pay for it because he believes that we need to pay for this and not put this on the back of Americans who've been really having the brunt of this of this economic crisis and their pandemic he wants to hear he wants to hear the the, the good faith effort we got a uh, we got a, a counter uh, proposal from from Republicans last Friday on the American jobs plan we are reviewing we're gonna have those conversations with with the Republicans that put that forth. And also, we just announced today that the president's going to be meeting uh, with leadership on both the House and the, and the, and the Senate side, the, the big four, as they like to call them, on May 12th, and to continue to have those conversations with leadership as well. We believe, we believe that this infrastructure plan that we've been talking about should get bipartisan support because we have seen bipartisan support outside of Washington, D.C., Republicans, independents, Democrats. So legislators, we should come together and get bipartisan support on this piece of legislation, both the American Jobs Plan and the Americans' Families Plan. And, Corrine, lastly, you, of course, served as chief of staff for Kamala Harris after her nomination yeah. as vice president in the 2020 campaign. I keep imagining this moment, right, where tonight we're going to have yeah. President Biden in the forefront and then two women uh, right behind him, of course, Vice President Harris and Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. Kind of give us a sense of, of what you can imagine is going to be running through your mind and yeah. so many others watching that moment. It is. It's in a historic moment tonight. I have a, a little six-year-old girl. I, I'm excited for her to see this for herself um, so she can see herself uh, through uh, the speaker and, and the vice president. It's a historic moment. And I, you know, I, I also want to add, since you've given me the opportunity, when you look at, you see uh, Kamala Harris, the first black woman, first woman of Asian 
descent, who a heritage, who is the vice president, standing next to the president on almost every issue and being a partner. And you look at the cabinet as a whole and the diversity that you see in this cabinet, how this is the most diverse cabinet ever in a presidency. I think that should make people feel good about what we're bringing forth, what the president is talking about, because he truly wants to bring everybody to the table. So tonight, yes, uh, to your point, Lindsay, tonight's going to be a historic night, and I look forward to seeing that. Corinne Jean-Pierre, we really appreciate you talking with us Thank and coming you, on Lindsay. the show. Thank you, Appreciate it. And when we come back, the three teenagers who are lucky to be alive after the car they were in exploded on the side of the highway. They are talking about their dramatic escape tonight. Plus, the Supreme Court case that could have profound implications on how far schools can go to policing students' social media. And it all started with a Snapchat post. But up next, it's America's longest war. And as we prepare to leave Afghanistan, the question, are we safer? And who stands to win or lose the most when we leave? With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast, 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights, The View, the number one daytime talk show, and ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. These are newly released images of the attack on Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick during the January 6th insurrection. In the video, you can see him hit with pepper spray and then bent over, rubbing his face. According to a medical examiner, he died of natural causes when he suffered two strokes the day after the mob riot. Two men have been charged with assaulting him. After nearly 20 years, American forces are now set to withdraw from Afghanistan, ending our longest war by September 11th. But what comes next? The top Taliban is already warning the U.S. to leave by an earlier May 1st deadline or else. And what about the people left behind, especially women? Ian Panel is in Kabul tonight and has this in-depth report. Into the heart of Taliban land, just outside the provincial capital of Afghanistan's north, Mazari Sharif. These are the militant fundamentalists we went to war against almost 20 years ago. Today, heavily armed and more powerful and confident than at any time since they were overthrown by US and local forces. Checkpoints mark where government control ends. They run a shadow government with courts and here at least, even schools for girls. 
funded by the Afghan government but overseen by the Taliban. برای ما این قمی گفت که با ایجاب بیاین ایجاب خواهی از طرق اسلام برای ما خود ما گفته باید ما ایجاب رایت کنیم در مکتب خوندنی ایچ کدام مامنت برای ما نمیگه But look how it's only young girls in the classroom. The Taliban criticised for limiting or banning older girls from class. Nearly 20 years have passed since the US launched a bloody, costly war in Afghanistan, with the troops now leaving, many asking what the blood and treasure was for. There have been more than 2,400 US military deaths and over 3,800 American contractors killed here. Over 20,000 have been wounded in America's battle to eradicate terror. It's cost more than $2.2 trillion, according to a Brown University study. But the highest cost has been to the people of Afghanistan. With the same study finding more than 47,000 innocent civilians have been killed. But by September, the U.S. will finally close the chapter on its longest war. We cannot continue the cycle of extending or expanding our military presence in Afghanistan, hoping to create ideal conditions for the withdrawal and expecting a different result. I'm now the fourth United States president to preside over American troop presence in Afghanistan. Two Republicans, two Democrats. I will not pass this responsibility onto a fifth. Though the money and lives can be quantified, what comes next for America's security is less clear. The worry is that something might be constituted again because it's so hard to keep track of people or plots that develop in these very, very remote regions. So short term, the risk is quite low. Long term, the risk will be another counterterrorism risk where we'll be worried about uh, terrorists plotting to attack the U.S. again. And the danger for Afghans is less remote. The Taliban are almost at the gates of many major towns and cities. They now control or contest large swaths of the country and are stronger than at any time since their fall in 2001. Their ideology haven't changed. Their global claim to jihad haven't changed. They are more confident of their victory. And they uh, think that they have defeated the United States and NATO. We went on patrol with Afghan security forces today. Assalamu alaikum. It's something of a losing game of whack-a-mole trying to prevent attacks in the cities that the government controls. The Taliban may have signed a deal with the United States, but it hasn't signed a deal with the Afghan government. The police, the army are in daily battles against the militants who've also engaged in a campaign of terror, targeted assassinations here in Kabul and elsewhere across the country. While the battle against the Taliban has failed to uproot them from the country, there have been some major gains in the last 20 years for the economy, education and society, but above all, for women. Female enrolment in secondary schools grew from just 6% in 2003 to 39% in 2017. Women's life expectancy grew from 56 years in 2001 to 66 in 2017. And by 2020, 27% of parliamentary members in Afghanistan were women. Hello. Hello, Fauzia Subhan. One major female political figure is Fauzia Kufi. Her political career started after the fall of the Taliban in 2001. She's worked to help girls get back to school, for women's equality at home and in the workplace. But speaking out against the militants is dangerous here. Hundreds of women have been targeted, and Fauzia survived two assassination attempts. They removed bullets from here. But today she worries those gains will be lost. I feel like um, a lot of uncertainty, um, things that will be unpredictable, um, uh, uh, uncertainty in terms of what will happen to the woman. Can I ask, do you feel betrayed? I must say that, um, it, yes, it has become not only a strategic failure for our international friends, but I must say also a moral failure for our international friends in terms of leaving their main allies in the midst of nowhere and making the decision to leave Afghanistan. In a girl's high school in Kabul, dozens of teenagers attending class. But their education will no longer carry the guarantee offered by America's presence here. 
What are your thoughts about the future? You're aware that the Americans, the foreigners are now leaving Afghanistan. Do any of you have concerns about the future? What are your thoughts? Yes, we have. This is a new generation, teenagers born after the US invasion, and they've been given something denied of their mothers, an education. We are all worrying about the stopping of our schools. Uh, my mom went to school, but when the Taliban came to Afghanistan, she um, uh, was not allowed to go uh, to school. Uh, she wants me to learn everything I want to learn. Uh, she is doing everything for us uh, to uh, go to school go to school and learn our studies. Talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban have stalled. And for these girls, their lives, their futures and their dreams hang in the balance. Like we have hopes, we have wishes, we have like women have the best ideas. So if like the Taliban regime took over one son, like every, everything, the door of our minds, the door of our hopes will be closed and we cannot uh, do whatever we want. After the invasion, the U.S. expanded its mission to winning hearts and minds to nation-building, hoping this would defeat extremism and leave Afghanistan stable, more prosperous and, crucially, an important ally in a region beset by enemies. But the nation and its military are still fragile. Al-Qaeda, ISIS and the Taliban are still here. Corruption's widespread and progress patchy. The withdrawal risks losing the support of many, especially if the extremists return in strength. Many fear it'll leave US national security exposed again and leave behind the young girls who dare to dream of a better life. I am Farhad. I want to be a good businesswoman in future. I'm Masura, and I'm going to be an international businesswoman. I'm Hadia, and I want to be a doctor. I'm Medija and I want to be a journalist for raising my people and women voice. Ian Panel in Kabul, Afghanistan for ABC News. Hopefully they have bright futures ahead. Our thanks to Ian for that and still ahead here on Prime. The prom dress confrontation that ended with a CEO being fired over what he said to the teen boy who was wearing it. And with President Biden speaking to Congress and the nation, we take a look at similar speeches by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, paying tribute to an American hero, Michael Collins. He was part of the moon mission, but stayed on the ship. He lived a life of service. And tonight, the tributes like this one from his family continue to come in. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you believe the The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone, with President Biden's first address to a joint session of Congress tonight. We take a look at these historic speeches and why this one stands out by the numbers. On his 99th day in office, President Biden makes his first joint address as president. As a senator for 36 years and a vice president for eight years, Biden has attended the State of the Union and joint addresses of eight different presidents, but now it's his turn. In a typical year, more than 1,600 people would attend a joint address, but because of the pandemic, that number was reduced to about 200. And with many cabinet members watching virtually, no designated survivor was necessary. Also unique for this moment for the first time in u.s history the two people sitting behind the president during the address are women and finally as biden hits the 100 day milestone his approval rating stands at 52 percent according to an abc news washington post poll that's 10 percentage points above president trump's approval at this point in his presidency but it also makes biden the third least popular president after 100 days than we've seen in modern times and we still have lots to get to here on prime tonight the new warning for travelers about the companies trying to take advantage of the fact that airline bookings are skyrocketing. Our conversation with the scientist who just pulled off a feet 19,000 feet in the air and what it could tell us about our changing planet. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. We will guide you through it all tonight. made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richie. We tell all our patients how much they are loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline.
Federal agents escalated their ongoing investigation into Rudy Giuliani, searching his home and office here in Manhattan and seizing his phone, electronic devices and other items as they examine his efforts to dig up dirt in Ukraine on former President Trump's political rivals, activity that surfaced in the first Trump impeachment inquiry. Rudy Giuliani has made no secret of his desire to get Ukraine to open investigations into the Bidens. Today, Giuliani's son lashed out. This is disgusting. This is absolutely absurd, and it's the continued politicization of the Justice Department that we have seen. ABC News has learned federal prosecutors wanted to do this last fall, but the request was denied by the Trump Justice Department because it was too close to the election. A former Ohio police officer is facing a new charge in the fatal shooting of Andre Hill. Adam Coy pleaded not guilty to one count of reckless homicide. The fired Columbus officer is already facing murder charges after Hill was fatally shot in December while holding a cell phone. Coy said he thought it was a gun. Dalton Stevens is a senior at Franklin High School in Tennessee. And when prom season rolled around, he knew he wanted to make a statement. A man can be beautiful in a dress, and even if it wasn't, that wasn't pushed across, it was that a man can feel confident in a dress. The boys and their friends taking pictures at a local hotel. And then the night took a turn. You look like an idiot. Sam Johnson, the CEO of a telehealth company, began harassing the couple. There's hair on your chest. You shouldn't be wearing a dress you this that the video shot by Jacob shows Johnson swatting towards the camera at which point other parents stepped in it's kids it's a bunch of kids Come on. hotel staff then intervening Dalton and Jacob going off to enjoy prom together I had an amazing prom night men's fashion a hot button issue since Harry Styles covered Vogue wearing a dress back in December around the same time Sam Johnson tweeted I predict a sharp decline in quote soft men in the very near future Johnson has been fired from his job as the CEO of Visual. Three teenagers lucky to be alive after this explosion on a Texas highway. Oh. Oh. The explosion booming across the lanes of Highway 114 outside Dallas. Under the car, and I saw that there was flames. The passengers escaping just in time. Authorities rushing to the scene where nobody was hurt. At the U.S. Supreme Court, a debate over free speech on social media and whether public schools can punish students for what they say off campus. I'm frightened to death of writing a stand. Justice Stephen Breyer acknowledging the big stakes for schools, parents, and teens nationwide. The case involves a former high school cheerleader from Pennsylvania who was suspended from her team in 2017 after sending a vulgar Snapchat to friends on a weekend. I said it was F school, F cheer, F softball, F everything. Thing. The justices voiced support for Brandy Levy and the need to protect free speech. She blew off steam like millions of other kids. I mean, a year's suspension from the team just seems excessive to me. But some justices were wary of broad limits on school discipline in the fight against cyberbullying. Outside of school, there has to be a clear rule. That's what I'm looking for. A decision is expected by the end of June. Do you regret sending the, the FU snap? Now, I'll be I mean, now that I think about it, I feel like I shouldn't have done it, but it just, it is what it is. I was 14, I was young, I wasn't thinking. A new travel alert as more people get vaccinated. Many are starting to finally plan those much needed getaways, but as airline bookings are skyrocketing, a warning for travelers about some third party booking companies. Our Rebecca Jarvis has this report on how to avoid those extra fees. Kathleen Marcosi needed to rebook her family's flight from Orlando. I googled how do I get a person with American Airlines and then I called that number that came up. She says someone answered right away. I asked if I was speaking to American Airlines. He said that I am a representative of American Airlines. She says he told her it would cost $400 to change her flights. But she says she became suspicious when he sent her a document to sign from a company called Travel Service Pad. I said, I'm not signing this. And he said, you have to sign it or you're going to lose your flight. She says she then called American Airlines directly and was able to change her flights free of charge. Consumers need to be careful when they're online searching for an airline or other travel service. They may come across a website that looks like it's the real deal, 
but it could be a third party that's going to charge an extra fee for a transaction that you could have done for yourself for free. Security expert Teresa Payton says this can happen all too easily. Why are people making this mistake? You look up, rebook my flight, and you put in the airline's name and a number comes up. Chances are, if that travel company has purchased a Google ad and put in the search engine terms, things like the airline name, rebooking flights, that that ad will be one of the first results returned to you. These service providers, how might you know if you're on a call with one of them? to avoid accidentally talking to one of them. Really do your homework first. The company Kathleen Marcosi spoke to, Travel Service Pad, also known as Globe Hunters, has a D rating and an alert from the Better Business Bureau. We've opened an investigation into the pattern that we're seeing. And the Florida Attorney General's office says it's investigating complaints about Travel Service Pad and Globe Hunters. The company's telling ABC News, we never say on the call that we are the airline. We never charge the customer without the customer actually acknowledging all the flight details and change fees by signing the document sent to them from the agent. Our thanks to Rebecca. National Geographic announced yesterday that an expedition has successfully placed a weather station on a volcano in the Chilean Andes at 19,000 feet above sea level, making it the highest in the southern and western hemispheres. The station will send scientists near real-time data, such as temperature, relative humidity, wind speed and atmospheric pressure. The team was led by climate scientist and National Geographic explorer Dr. Baker Perry, who has also installed a network of weather stations, including the two highest in the world on Mount Everest. Dr. Perry is here to tell us more. Welcome to the show, Dr. Perry. We really appreciate you talking with us. You certainly have a lot of experience installing weather stations in some remote places. Tell us about the challenge of getting up to the top of a volcano at 19,000 feet, all while carrying your gear, and by the way, a large weather station. This expedition was uh, a major challenge uh, from the beginning. It's a very remote mountain in Chile. It's extremely high. It's very windy, and we were pinned down by a blizzard on part of the expedition. Uh, our horse team encountered a very deep snow uh, on the higher mountain that uh, made it a major challenge moving things up. And, uh, and we had a tremendous team that we worked with that uh, ultimately uh, led us to a successful expedition. So we were very fortunate for that regard. And the expedition, of course, took place right in the middle of the global pandemic. How were you and your team of 12 able to pull this off safely? The pandemic was another major challenge that uh, presented um, a number of logistical considerations. So I had to arrive uh, two weeks early for a quarantine. Our uh, photographer that came in from Mexico also quarantined for an extended period of time. Our entire Chilean team joined us at the end of the quarantine. We had multiple COVID tests. We had an expedition doctor on the um, on the mountain as well that was enforcing the protocols and uh, also conducting COVID testing. And so that was a, a, another major challenge, of course, on this expedition. And just a little while ago, we showed some video of just some wind, just it seems like punishing wind over the tents there. Is it, does it feel as brutal as it looks? It was. It was. It was pretty brutal out there. Uh, the uh, temperature was well below zero, and uh, the winds were were quite high. Fortunately, we had come down and had successfully installed the weather station by that point. Uh, but um, uh, we were uh, pinned in our tents for for quite some time, for sure. And the weather stations that you install on these high remote peaks have to be light enough to carry up the mountain and then assembled on site. Uh, we can see it. I believe we have some video of it. How steady and reliable are they in such difficult climates? Well, we, these stations have been engineered to withstand winds well over 200 miles an hour, and uh, we're pretty confident in the ability of the structure to withstand the winds. What is a bit of an unknown is uh, whether the instruments can in withstand direct impacts from small rocks that are sometimes picked up by these extremely high winds. And when a, 
when a rock impacts a, a wind sensor or a temperature sensor or a solar panel at 150 miles an hour, it can uh, do some substantial damage. And so that is the big unknown as to how long these instruments will, will last in those conditions. Uh, but we're going to try to keep them going as, as long as we can. And considering many of the challenges that you've just been describing, why was it so important to install this weather station in Chile right now? Well, this weather station in Chile right now is so important because the entire region around Santiago is in the middle of a mega drought. And since 2010, precipitation is rainfall down low and snowfall up high has been well below normal. This is a region with over 6 million people. And uh, the long-term impacts on the water resources are a major concern because glaciers are retreating and uh, with more variable precipitation patterns, there is real concern about the future of this water tower that provides such important resources downstream. And what else does it tell us about the, the rest of our planet as far as all this, this data that you're able to collect from the, these weather stations? Well, one of the real uh, interesting factors is that even though these highest reaches of the planet where the glaciers are found are so important for water resources, we, we don't really have many observations from these locations and, and don't fully understand the meteorological processes that are driving the disappearance of the glacier ice. And so uh, these observations are critically important, not only in Chile, but also across the Himalayas and other portions of the Andes to uh, make better projections of future climate change and especially water resource availability. And lastly, how long did it take you to get up and down, and, and which way is, is the more challenging of the two? Well, it was a 15-day expedition. We started uh, walking at uh, 6,000 feet and uh, went up over 21,000 feet. And uh, I think coming down is uh, more of a challenge, especially on summit day when uh, we're tired and uh, and uh, it's been a long day already and just being extra careful of coming down when uh, our reserves are depleted are, are certainly the biggest challenge, I think. Dr. Perry, we thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you talking with us. Thank you so much for having me. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. This military handout shows rocket artillery heading to Afghanistan and the arrival of B-52s in Qatar to help protect U.S. troops as they start leaving America's longest war. According to experts, the photos, which were posted on the military's Twitter account, are intended to be visual reminders to the Taliban that America means business when it says it will protect its troops. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, our coverage of President Biden's speech to the nation continues.